this is part of atherosclerosis. We get blockages in different parts of our body. If it goes to the brain, the arteries to our head, we get stroke. Arteries to our heart, uh, we get um, angina, heart attack. To the kidneys, we lose circulation to the kidneys. Now to the legs, uh, we have problems with uh, discomfort, loss of limbs. So we're going to learn how to um, what, what is peripheral vascular disease in some details. I'm really excited about this. Take it away. All right. Thank you, Dr. Kearney. So today for our presentation, we thought we would begin with some questions for the audience. So have you ever felt this symptom? My legs cramp up when I'm moving, but usually subsides when I sit down. Well, if you have, that's a classic sign of claudication and a sign you might have um, PAD. So peripheral artery disease is a widespread disease all over the world, especially plaguing the elder uh, generations. So if you have PAD, you might have several questions in mind, um, like what is claudications? What are my risks? What are some treatment options? Is exercise enough or should I get surgery? What medications can I take? Is it reversible? So uh, today, hopefully, we'll get to answering some of your questions and help you learn more about this condition. So without further ado, I'll pass it on to Harine um, for our introductions. So today, we're going to be, oh, so first, we're going to be starting to talk about what is peripheral artery disease. So it can be described as when there is a narrowing or blockage of the vessels that carry blood from the heart to the legs and or other lower extremities. It is primarily caused by atherosclerosis, and this is when there's a buildup of fatty plaque in the arteries which block and limit the flow of blood into the lower limbs. As a result, the muscles and tissues in the lower extremities may not receive the required amount of oxygen and nutrients to meet its metabolic needs, whether it be at rest or during exercise. While peripheral artery disease most frequently does occur in the legs, it can also impact the arteries that leads to your head, your stomach, and kidneys to a lesser degree. If this description seems any similar to what you may have been experiencing or have heard, it may be because you have heard one of its other names or related buzzwords, such as hardening of the arteries, peripheral arterial disease, peripheral vascular disease, or poor circulation. So peripheral artery disease increases with age in both men and women, which makes logical sense as plaque buildup accrues over one's life. However, currently peripheral artery disease is severely underdiagnosed and undertreated, with approximately 75% of PAD cases going undiagnosed. So why is this a problem? Most often, peripheral artery disease serves as a warning sign. This is because if you have plaque in your legs, you probably have plaque in other places as well. And this is dangerous as it could lead to other conditions. For example, if you have plaque buildup in the arteries that supply your heart, it could lead to coronary artery disease and or heart attacks. If you have plaque buildup in the arteries that supply your kidneys, it could lead to renal artery disease or renal failure. In fact, peripheral artery disease in and of itself could lead to having the affected limb itself removed and amputated if the tissue dies. To put this into perspective, of those living with limb, limb loss currently, 54% of them are due to peripheral artery disease. That means just above half of the amputations done are because of this condition. So how exactly can you tell if you have peripheral artery disease? Well, the classic symptom of peripheral artery disease is pain in the legs with physical activity, such as walking, that gets better after rest, a phenomenon referred to as claudication. Symptoms of pain, aches, or cramps that arise from walking or physical exertion can happen in the buttock, the hip, the thighs, or calves. In terms of common signs, physical signs in the leg that may indicate peripheral artery disease include muscle atrophy or weakness, hair loss, smooth, shiny skin, skin that is cool to the touch, decreased or absent pulses in the feet, sores or ulcers in the legs and feet that don't heal with time, as well as cold or numb toes. However, the problem is, is that up to 4 in 10 people with peripheral artery disease have no leg pain, which contributes to the reason why it is so largely underdiagnosed and undertreated. In fact, you can also have severe blockages with no pain at all, and this is usually because your body grows blood vessels around the blockages to continue providing the oxygen and fuel your tissues and muscles require. So, so it's important to remember that we, we get aches and pains for all sorts of reasons. Once you're old, you're age of 50, just myself, arthritis becomes a problem. So we have to distinguish between just arthritis, which are pain in the joints, and then pain in the muscles, which are like the calves or, or the classic. You know, like usually have one leg worse than the other. So um, then there's always something called spinal stenosis, where you have narrowing of 
of uh, coming out of your spine, and that could actually lead to uh, discomfort and poor mobility as well. So, um, so it gets a little bit complicated. So remember, arthritis is arthritis. These are aches and pains that we get in the joints, and peripheral artery disease, blocked arteries, the leg usually called what exertion, and more classically, are in the calf. Other places as well. Take it, take it away. Yeah, so the spectrum of peripheral artery disease itself is quite wide in terms of disease severity, and commonly either the Fontaine or Rutherford classification system is utilized to place individuals with peripheral artery disease within three main different categories. So the first major category consists of cases where patients are asymptomatic. So 20 to 50% of patients diagnosed with this condition are asymptomatic, which means that they experience no symptoms, but they usually have functional impairment when tested. As the disease progresses and blood vessels narrow further, arterial flow into the lower extremities worsen and the symptoms may manifest either as classic intermittent claudication or as atypical claudication or leg discomfort. Intermittent claudication is defined as leg muscle discomfort provoked by exertion that is relieved with rest, while atypical claudication or leg discomfort is defined as lower extremity discomfort that is exertional, meaning that arises due to exercise, but does not consistently resolve with rest. And about 10 to 35% of all peripheral artery disease patients report symptoms of classic intermittent claudication, and 40 to 50% of patients present with the atypical form, which is more prevalent. From here, as the disease progresses even further, patients may develop more severe claudication and have a reduced walking distance and eventually experience pain even during rest. And in 5 to 10% of cases, claudication progresses to a worsened severity of the disease called critical limb ischemia. And critical limb ischemia is when there is pain at rest due to lack of blood flow for more than 14 days and ulceration, tissue loss, or gangrene occurs. And gangrene refers to dead or dying body tissue that occurs because of inadequate blood supply. And commonly, this occurs because when Peripheral artery disease progresses to critical limb ischemia when open source, an injury or an infection of your feet or leg don't heal and instead progress and cause tissue death. And as a result, there is a high risk for actual tissue loss, amputation and cardiovascular events. So it can be easy to remember the signs of critical limb ischemia specifically by remembering the six Ps. So to begin, there's pain. And this is basically when symptoms range from muscle burning or cramping to severe pain, and also when the muscles themselves become tender to palpitation. Um, the second is pulselessness or pulse deficit. So there's a loss of pulse in the affected limb. The third is pallor. So due to the lack of blood flow, the skin on the affected limb becomes pale when you look at it. Um, the fourth is perishingly cold or um, or poikilothermia, and this is when the limb itself becomes cold. And this is because the limb lost its ability to self-regulate its temperature and will become the same temperature as its surroundings. The next one is paresthesis. So this is when there's a prickling and numbness in the affected limb. And this is typically described as pins and needles in terms of like the sensation of it. And the last is paralysis. And this is basically just the inability to move the affected limb, likely because there's a lot of tissue death that occurred in that area. All right, so now we will be talking about causes and risk factors of PAD. So as Harina already explained, uh, to put it simply, PAD occurs when your limbs are not receiving enough blood to keep up with their body's demands. And this is usually a result of narrowed arteries which reduce blood flow to your limbs, which um, can be indicative of an accumulation of fatty deposits, so plaque in your arteries, and this is known as arthrosclerosis. Um, this mainly reduces blood flow to your legs, but it can also reduce blood flow to your arms as well. But while arthrosclerosis is usually the main cause of PAD, there are less common causes as well, including blood vessel inflammation, injury to your limbs, unusual anatomy of your ligaments or muscles, radiation exposure. But regardless, in all of these scenarios, there is an inherent ability of blood to inadequately flow to your arteries. All right, so moving on to risk factors. So there is an array of array, uh, risk factors for PAD, but there are two notable ones, diabetes and smoking. So diabetes affects the lining around the cells in your blood vessels. So this means that your blood vessels aren't as flexible as they need to be to help blood flow smoothly. And then in smoking, uh, smoking causes abnormalities in endothelial function, lipoprotein metabolism, coagulation, and platelet function, which can further block your arteries. 
So other factors include obesity, which would be a BMI over 30, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and an age above 60, and a family history of heart disease and stroke. And then uh, PAD can also be caused by high levels of homocysteine. Homocysteine is an amino acid which helps make your body which helps make your body <laughs> helps make your body um, build and maintain tissues. If you have a blood clotting disorder or a kidney or a kidney disease, that can also increase your risk of PAD. But more importantly, which is kind of prevalent nowadays with pandemic, well, kind of the end, uh, a sedentary lifestyle can also contribute to PAD. And now it should be noted that if you do have PAD, you're also at risk of developing coronary artery disease or cerebrovascular disease. Great, thank you. So before we dive into the diagnosis, we'll look at the prognosis for patients with PAD in some severe cases. So prognosis for patients is usually poor. So while the disease itself may be tre treatable, PAD usually indicates an underlying condition as mentioned. Um, so some form of coronary artery disease usually that leads to high mortality rates in this population. So in a study by Walton et al. in 2008, investigating the prognosis of coronary uh, artery disease patients with or without PAD, they found out that uh, PAD patients had a worse long-term prognosis than the control with a hazard ratio of 2.4, meaning that those with PAD had more than double the chances of experiencing the cardiovascular-related events that they measured, including heart failure, fatal bleeding, stroke, arrhythmia, and cardiovascular-related deaths. So, there are many complications that come with living with PAD as well. A simple injury like an open wound on the limb could be detrimental. The poor circulation deprives the wound of the necessary blood, um, leading to delayed healing that can lead to limb loss in some cases. So to really emphasize this point, I have included some images. So this is a content warning before I reveal them. Some of the content in the following contain material that may be harmful or traumatizing for some individuals. So please look away now if you are sensitive to this kind of content. So the image to the uh, left shows a, um, a feet of a 91 year old experiencing PVD, so peripheral vascular disease. And you can see that um, there is some gangrene and then, and he does have one of the risk factors, which is the age. Um, the uh, image to the right shows a 50 year old woman and she has two of the risk factors. She has type two diabetes and hypertension. And the image is kind of hard to see, but she is missing some toes. Um, okay, so I guess I can take on the diagnostic section, that diagnosis section. Um, so taking a detailed medical history is very important when diagnosing PAD as it can help with other possibilities and narrow down the diagnosis of peripheral artery disease. So your physician will ask you questions about your medical history, including past and current health issues, symptoms, and risk factors present. Um, communicating to your doctor is key here. Um, the more information your physician knows, the better. Um, so a pulse uh, volume reading is a non-invasive test that is used to gather data about a patient's arterial pressure in their arms and legs. There are three types of pulse readings, ankle brachial index, exercise testing, PVR, and thoracic uh, outlet testing. So the ankle uh, brachial index is a non-invasive test that uh, Re, uh, produces relatively quick results. Um, this test compares blood pressure in the patient's ankle um, with the blood pressures in their arms using ultrasound and a blood pressure cuff. This test may be done before or after exercise to compare results. A low brachial index is approximately 0.9 um, or lower. At, a low brachial index of approximately 0.9 or lower indicates PAD. So above 0.9 is normal, 0.8 to 0.7 is moderate, and 0 0.6 to 0 0.3 is severe and may need amputation. Um, so I think Dr. Kearney can speak uh, as well on this, but we are implementing um, ankle brachial index uh, uh, syst uh, testing systems in the uh, testing systems in the clinic uh, coming up very soon. So uh, in the meantime, we have uh, prepared this Google form for you to fill out. You can take a screenshot of the link here, or you can. Um, we'll be linking it in the description. 
And uh, this is just to gain a little more information about your current risk and state. And if you have any other questions regarding PAD, you can ask it in this form here. And the other table that you see um, to the right of the form um, is just the health record that is that you can find at the back of Dr. Kernu's book, 30 Days to a Healthier You. Um, we have also linked the full image in the Google form, so you can access it there as well. Um, and this is just to help keep track of uh, your current journey and your um, and getting more active and kind of see where you should what you should be aiming for. Yeah, so it's interesting. We were going to do ankle brachial index uh, a couple of years ago, um, but because of the pandemic, uh, we put that on hold. So that's something we're going to hopefully do really shortly. We'll uh, uh, get this Doppler probe and uh, we'll try to measure, especially in people who smoke, uh, who have diabetes, but mostly smokers worry me the most, and people who get pains in their legs with activities. And again, atherosclerosis or blocked arteries, as we mentioned, is a very diffuse process. In my way of thinking, it starts in your, around your stomach, your aorta, and then it goes more distally towards your heart, your neck, and more towards your legs. So if you have severe peripheral vascular disease in your lower extremity, especially if it requires surgery, your life expectancy is, is shortened um, because you have blockages in multiple areas of the body. And we're going to talk about things like surgery or angioplasty. But to be honest with you, this is a, a disease of all your blood vessels. And taking care of all your blood pressures is, is, is important. So uh, this is a plea for people to fill up uh, or go look at our book, 30 Days to a Healthier You. Read that book 10 times and get healthier on a regular basis. And fill out some of the health report cards there. You know, what is your blood pressure? What is your cholesterol? What is your blood sugar? Where's your hemoglobin 1C? How much exercise are you doing? Well, right now I'm in Tofino and uh, I'm walking during this webinar. So I'm going to make sure that I get my steps in. I keep myself as healthy as I possibly can. Um, I worked very hard to get my body mass index to around 24. So if I can do it, you can do it too. So figure ways to be healthier. And, uh, and let's, let's work, let's figure a better connection and better ways to think about this. Take it away. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Kernu. And we'll be looking at our last of the diagnostic tests. So a vascular ultrasound is a non-invasive test that is used to analyze and visualize blood flow in a patient's arm and legs. During this ultrasound, high-frequency sound waves are transmitted through the body and reflected off of blood cells, um, which can then be used to calculate the speed of these cells. Uh, and so now we'll be moving on to the treatment section. Yeah, so treatment uh, is... Go to treatment, one more, more, more plea here is that we mentioned things like blood pressure. So um, what I recommend everybody to do is get their own blood pressure machine. Every family should uh, have, have this in their repertoire. And again, what I would do is two weeks before your next appointment, measure three blood pressures in the morning when you're relaxed and three blood pressures at nighttime. And then average those latter two and those average blood pressure, a two week period of time will give you your average blood pressure. Ideal blood pressure is 110 over, over 70. And if your blood pressure is consistently over 130 over 80, we can talk about whether or not we should think about instituting medication uh, to that. Uh, there's a DASH diet to lower your blood pressure, dietary approach to stopping hypertension. So lots of fruits and vegetables, uh, high potassium foods, low salt foods can, can contribute to, to blood pressure. And also I'm getting my vitamin D right now by just being outside. So if I can do it, you can do it as well. Make sure you know your cholesterol, make sure you know what your pills are for and why you're taking them. And, and uh, the best way to treat peripheral disease is to prevent from happening in the first place. And that can be done in 80% of us if, uh, if we, we do it well. I realize that we're not all perfect and we're gonna fall off the wagon, but get back on and let's figure a way to keep yourself healthy. And so, and so to me is that, that discomfort that occurs in the calf of the muscles with activity, it worries me. Um, I have to sit down and sit down at this, this, this bench over here. I got these aches and pains in my calf. I get up, I walk, um, and I can't soar. That's probably peripheral vascular disease. And we can actually think about feeling your pulses. We can look at your legs for ulcers and breakdown of the skin. And, and you saw some of those pictures of, amputations, the last thing you want to do is lose your ability to walk. So 
uh, walk, walk, walk. And let's find out how we can treat this as well. Take it away. Yeah, so treatment is, there's a couple different ways. So we're going to look at exercise we're going to look at a couple of medications. And then finally, we're going to look at surgery. So surgery isn't always the first step at, uh, at any point. So we're going to start with physical activity, uh, which has been constant, consistently demonstrated as the most effective treatment for PAD. Uh, studies have shown that consistent treadmill exercises improves both pain-free walking distance and the maximum treadmill walking distance in people with PAD. Uh, a meta-analysis was done by Gardner et al. And it concluded that the most effective exercise programs consist of three treadmill sessions per week in which patients walk at least 30 minutes per session for a minimum of six months in duration or longer. So that's kind of listed kind of at the bottom of the slide there. Uh, while several studies have demonstrated efficacy of treadmill exercise under supervised conditions, it also can be done at home uh, by yourself. And it's just as effective. Uh, Gardner et al. did another study looking at home-based exercise and found very similar results. Uh, participants increased their maximal time spent on treadmill by 112 seconds uh, and their maximal distance walked by six meters. Uh, so these distances were comparable to when that uh, treatment was done under supervised care. Um, and home-based exercise obviously has benefits. It avoids the time, effort, and cost associated with travel to a medical center for supervised exercise and has the potential to be more accessible and, and acceptable to patients with PID while giving the same uh, benefits as supervised exercise. So this is a, another um, exercise I found uh, and it was done in another study. So treadmill walking outside, those are definitely options, but another option is actually aquatic walking. Um, and it, it, that's a, a different twist, uh, but aquatic walking can help relieve arterial stiffness among patients with peripheral artery disease. Uh, so a study was done and they followed this um, kind of plan on the screen here. So they had the warm up for 10 minutes followed by some main exercise and a cool down. And they found in a 12 week study that, uh, that there were significant improvements compared to pre-exercise for many different areas. So we're gonna go into a bit of detail about some of these in a bit, but there are six minute walk uh, tests that showed that after this, after kind of completing these, uh, this training, they, were, they had a greater six minute walk time test versus uh, before doing it. And there was some other strength uh, in their legs and in their hand grip. And so this, this study showed that there were benefits to kind of doing this training uh, versus if you prefer the water versus maybe just the treadmill or walking outside. Yeah, so an important point about exercise as a form of therapy that we wanted to drive home is that the most important component is consistency. So when we looked at many of these trials, the data often fell short and was limited because the exercise group had poor compliance to the treatment. So for example, a study by Colomay et al. in 2022 attempted to, attempted to characterize the difference between the treatment, uh, uh, sorry, attempted to characterize the difference uh, the difference between the treatment via surgery uh, or a supervised exercise regimen. However, the study was cut short as the study faced many challenges with the exercise group. So one month into the study, um, already uh, the only 75 of the 144 that were originally recruited remained. Two months into the study, it went back, to, it went down to 68. And six months into the study, um, there were only 57 left. So some must drew uh, informed consent after being allocated to the exercise uh, training regimen group. Uh, for others, the therapy was not reimbursed by their health insurance. Others left for logistic reasons. Um, some stopped because they had achieved their personal goal. Um, others quit because of lack of motivation and 15 patients dropped out without, uh, with unclear reasons. So within one year of follow-up, 33% of patients allocated to the exercise group had underwent surgery for iliac arteries and two had undergone uh, surgical revascularization. Um, so in another study, um, uh, looking at kind of the same thing, um, the study was again concluded prematurely because of failure to recruit. Though there were several factors, one of the main reasons that they cited was that while many patients had clear ideas of what the treatment was, they simply did not want to do it. So for the surgery group, the patient did not feel comfortable with the small but present risks associated with balloon angioplasty, which was the surgical treatment they were texting, testing. And for others, the requirement to commit to a hospital-based supervised exercise program was a major disincentive. So given 
given these results, um, I'll be handing it over to Kiri from our Exercise and Motivation Club to talk about what you can do to assess yourself and some of the programs we currently run at the clinic to help you motivate yourself. Hi everyone, my name is Jerry and I'm going to talk about a little bit about the six minute walk test now. So we heard a little bit before from Evan about the six minute walk test and I just want to talk a little bit more about what this is. So basically what the test is, is it's measuring how far you can walk in six minutes. And it's a test that's used widely in research settings, so into cardiac research, the research on heart disease, so things like heart attack, heart failure, peripheral artery disease, as well as neuromuscular diseases and many more. So, Jerry, I think everybody should really think about doing different forms of marching yourself. So I really like this mm -hmm. six minute walk test and uh, is that uh, and, you know, you can just do it on a regular basis. So everybody pay attention to this. It's really good. Hey, Jerry, are we recording all this? Is the recording going OK? Yes, uh, it's recording on my computer, so it should be should be good. Great, because we want to make sure we share this for everybody right here. So six minute walk test. OK, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm listening up. Go ahead there, Jerry. Yes, so the six-minute walk test, like Dr. Kearney said, very important. And what it measures is your functional status. So kind of how well you're able to do specific tasks, whether that's walking or just kind of doing your daily activities. Uh, next slide, please. So how it's performed is first you want to get a stopwatch or you can use your phone. And what you want to do is to set a timer for six minutes. So set a timer and let it count down. And once you start, you're going to be walking at a normal pace so no speed walking, no running, just walk how you would normally walk for those six minutes and try to find uh, try to find a place where it's pretty flat. So there's no hills, there's no dips. Um, so a flat space. I'm going to keep walking at a normal pace for that six minutes and you're going to walk as far as you can. So if you're using your phone, you can look, track your distance for that. You can also track your distance for a Fitbit if you have one, an Apple Watch, or you can estimate your distance as well. So walk as far as you can for those six minutes. And if you need to take a break in between, uh, do not st stop the timer. So just pause, take a breath and keep going, uh, but do not, don't stop the timer during that break. So once you finish those six minutes, once that timer sounds, you can record your distance, you can do it on your phone, you can do it on paper and just keep that record for the future. Um, it doesn't have to be perfect. You can estimate that distance as well. So you can do this test either indoors, uh, if you can kind of draw, do some laps around your house, estimate that distance, or you can do it all outside, so on a track, or maybe on your neighborhood trail. You can uh, calculate the distance in that six minutes. Next slide, please. So now I just want to talk about some reference values, some scores that people get uh, for uh, in the research that they consider is more normal or more of the average. So for healthy adults, so this these studies kind of looked at adults between 20 to about 50 years old. They found that for men, on average, they're able to walk 585 to 638 meters. And then for women, uh, they walked on average about 555 to 593 meters. So they walked these distances in six minutes. Um, I do want to have a caveat that as you get older and, and uh, other factors like weight and height that can decrease the distance. So as you get older, the distance you walk will likely decrease. If you're a little bit heavier, distance will decrease as well. Um, but these are just some some mean values, some average values you can compare it to once you get your uh, results at the end. And I do want to note that there was a study looking at heart failure patients, and they found that in those patients, when walking less than 300 meters, that did predict an increased risk of death or hospitalizations within the next six months. So just some numbers to keep in mind uh, when you're looking at your results at the end. Yes, yeah, so uh, even if you have all these amazing resources at your hand, uh, staying motivated can be tough. Um, but on the screen, we can see some prime examples of what staying motivated can look like. So these are some photos sent by Dr. Kernew, uh, sharing some highlights of his trip. So um, some ways to stay active and uh, kind of get motivated is to explore the outdoors and spend some quality time with your loved ones. Um, so, uh, and we also have, have um, some programs that we want to run at the clinic. So I'll be handing it back over to Jerry again to kind of so, explain. So one of the things to, to realize is this is uh, on your left, that's my son, Josh, who loves outdoors. This is, uh, we went to Newfoundland uh, one year and uh, we went to Grossmore National Park. It's a great place. On your right is our home and we, uh, 
been having yearly picnics for God knows how long. This last couple of years since the pandemic, we didn't have one. So there's what, a, what our picnics looks like. And uh, hopefully we'll have something maybe this year. And uh, we're also thinking about doing some events uh, outdoors where we're actually going to do six minute walk tests for one thing. Um, and uh, ankle brachial reflexes, we'll check people's lung function. We'll make sure your blood pressure is up to date. Uh, and, uh, and a good healthy meal along the way. Uh, so some of the things to, to think about. And uh, Jerry, I remind people is that if you're using a walker or a cane, do your six minute walk test with your walker and your cane, uh, whatever you normally walk with. So Jerry, it's not a race, right? You don't wanna break the record. Or can you run on these things or, or you, can you walk faster? Or what, 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 when you say comfortable pace, because people, that's not as competitive. What happens with uh, people who wanna walk really fast or run? What we, we tell them about that? Yeah, so it's so the test is designed for walking. So if you are running or speed walking, that's going to change up the results and you're not going to be able to get very accurate results um, test to test and as well. You can't really compare it to the, the numbers that I showed you in the past. So if you are doing the six minute walk test, make sure that you're just walking. Um, it's not a race. You, um, you're you, you, you are trying to beat yourself with every test, but just make sure that you're walking comfortably. Um, so no running, no speed walking, just walk at your normal pace. Perfect. All right. So thank you, Yoyun, for bringing me today. Um, so I'm just going to introduce our Wednesday club. So um, me, alongside Hannah and Dia, we are the leaders for the Motivation, Mindfulness, and Moving group. So I really try to integrate the three pillars of what we think the three pillars of healthy living include. So exercise, motivation, also mindfulness. So in our meetings on Wednesdays, uh, we meet on Zoom at 7 p.m. We try a little bit of exercise. We share jokes, talk about motivation, some tips how to increase that, and also do a little bit of meditation. So we, we've been doing some chair yoga for the past couple of weeks. We've done Tai Chi before in the past, some light dancing, uh, light cardio workouts as well. So if you're interested in doing some uh, exercise with us, uh, joining a community to help keep you accountable and just to share a laugh, then you can join us every Wednesday on Zoom at 7 p.m. And if you're interested, you can sign up through a link below in the description for a Google form, or you can let Dr. Kearney know in your next visit, and we can sign you up for a group here. This is a wonderful resource. Uh, it took me 62 years to figure out uh, uh, that my brain, what I want, and what I do are two different things. And what I've learned is that uh, not to be hard on yourself, but to try different things and to, to move forwards. And the power of working together. This is a very safe environment, very safe group. This is something, uh, you know, there's often a, a meditation, there's a discussion of the day. Um, it it is, is an amazing opportunity. There's about three or four of these young superstars that really made me a better person and uh, they can make you a better person too as well. So my, my vote is to give it, give it a try. Uh, see, see, it's something that uh, fits to that, you know, is that the biggest mistake many of us make is afraid to try something new. Uh, our comfort zone and inertia, unfortunately, for many of us, does not, that does not allow us to, to improve and to experiment new, new beginnings. And so I really encourage everybody to try it a couple of times, see if that fits. And also the group is actually very prepared to find a time and talk to you individually uh, to help motivate you too as well and to just judge where, you're, where you are. Um, there are three types of situations that physicians deal with. The vast majority is people in crisis. Uh, people are sick or trying to make a diagnosis, which is really important. But you know what? It's better to prevent disease. And this is what, what we're doing in these sessions. And finally, the third is unfortunately palliation, how to um, spend the last remaining of your life. Um, and uh, once you have advanced peripheral vascular disease, the, cl the, talk, the, the clock is ticking. So Let's do something to uh, boost that up. And, uh, you know, is that once you lose your ability to be mobile, uh, the two reasons why people end up in nursing homes, number one is that they're losing their memory, their minds, they're getting demented. And number two, they just can't cope at home. And one is they can't walk, can't do normal activities of, of daily life. One thing that we do in the clinic is something called the stress test. So a stress test looks for how far you can exercise, looks at your blood pressure response to activity, and one measurement that we do is something called MET. One MET is 
your basic metabolic equivalent. That's just what you need to breathe, your basic metabolic rate. You need about five METs to four METs of activity just to function, to, to walk around the house, to do some house cleaning, to, to go grocery shopping. Anybody over nine to 12 METs tell you the good prognosis. That means that you have a lot of horsepower. And remember, if you take someone like Jerry or this team over and put them to bed for a couple of weeks, they will lose 25% of their oxygen maximum VO2 maximum. That means 25% of their work performance will go away within two weeks of a healthy person being immobile. Between the ages of 20 and 30, that's our maximum uh, VO2 maximum, maximum ability to perform work. As we get older, the body decays itself. So let's fight back and let's get some of years back about this. And uh, so uh, my plea to everybody is I'm walking right now. Go for a walk, listen to a webinar. Um, take it away, guys. Yeah, so we're going to hop back into a bit more science-y uh, treatment. Um, and so we're going to start with anticoagulants. And from my research and from studies, it's been found that uh, combination therapy could actually be more beneficial. So uh, in this study, they looked at a couple databases uh, across a very large span of years, about 30 years, uh, and they looked for randomized controlled trials of patients who received oral anticoagulant and antiplatelet therapy for PADs. So as you can see across the top row, these were the outcomes that they were looking to looking at uh, in the study. So they're both primary and secondary outcomes. And in the study, if you look at the, the groups, um, the ones that have warfarin plus aspirin are the ones that are the combination ones. So that's when you have both the antiplatelet and the anticoagulant uh, versus just the aspirin, which would be the anti, uh, antiplatelet only medication. So what they found um, is if you click uh, the first time. So in the blue uh, squares, they found that in these, the oral anticoagulant plus antiplatelet therapy for PAD may improve acute limb uh, ischemia, major amputation or stroke risk compared with antiplatelet uh, therapy alone. But if you click again uh, in the red column, the, uh, the risk of major bleeding events would increase. So there are benefits and uh, cons to having kind of the combination or just the, just the antiplatelet. And it is something obviously you'll have to discuss with Dr. Kernu or, or others and really just find that, that, um, that balance that works for you and that works for kind of your personal treatment. Um, another medication that could be used are statins. Um, so in this study, a uh, cohort of... One slide, go back one slide here. So what's kind of interesting is that uh, blocked arteries, uh, we treat traditionally with aspirin, 81 milligrams a day. Um, there's actually data, then uh, a trial called Capri looked at aspirin and a drug called clopidogrel, Plavix, and that showed to be uh, better than aspirin therapy, but increased the risk of bleeding. We played around with, with warfarin, coumadin, stronger blood thinners, and we found that, uh, and then finally, there, we use something now is that there are two trials called Compass Voyager, which showed that low dose aspirin, 81 milligrams a day, and low dose Xeralto at, um, uh, was, was actually the best combination. Uh, and that decreased cardiovascular events, but mostly stroke, especially you mentioned as, as we get older, stroke becomes a bigger problem. So, but we have to think about the risk of benefit versus the risk of bleeding. So we rarely use, for instance, warfarin or full dose anticoagulant, uh, such as Prada, Doxaban, Zeralto at 20 to 30 milligrams a day. Uh, we often use just one or the other because adding aspirin to that regimen increases the risk of bleeds by almost 50%. And uh, as we get older, we tend to bleed more. So it's always that balance. So, but there is a good balance right now, something called aspirin, 81 milligrams a day, and Xeralto 2.5 twice daily, or, uh, that's been shown to be effective. And it's something that's discussed whether that's right for you or, or not. Um, and so, uh, you know, people are, hear that, that we should stop aspirin. Uh, aspirin, we don't use in people who don't have blocked arteries at this point in time, because it does lower the risk of heart disease and stroke by about 10 to 15%, but increase the risk of bleeding by, by 50%. If you have blocked arteries to your neck, to your legs, or to your heart, 
you'll probably be on, on aspirin for the rest of your life. Maybe we're going to switch over to Plavix, especially if you have more blocked arteries to your lower extremities uh, at even a higher event rate for future heart attacks, strokes, and that amputations. Um, just taking that combination of a low dose of the blood thinner and aspirin can actually prevent stroke and salvage legs better. So that's really individual dis discussion. And we heard a little bit about the ankle brachial index. Uh, that becomes important to look at that. If you had severe peripheral vascular disease and you had an angioplasty or stent, that's, that's a problem that, that's not gonna go away. Uh, you will, will restore circulation, but you're, you're still at risk for future cardiovascular events. So those people should be on the combination of uh, Zeralto 2.5 twice daily and, and aspirin. And uh, that's important to discuss that with, with your physician. And, uh, and if you have an ankle brachial index that's extremely low, 0. 0.6, let's say, or less, then we should really talk about um, being on that combination as well. So again, I know it's a long discussion, but it's an important discussion because we want to, and that should be in addition to your walking program. Never give up walking. Because once you lose the ability to be mobile, uh, many people are not too far from the nursing home. So be careful. Go ahead. Yeah, so as Dr. Kerner just mentioned, um, these two studies, we will actually be discussing in a little bit more detail, the Voyager and Compass, I believe in, the, in a few slides, but um, Dr. Kerner obviously touched on it very well. And, and that is another very good point that he mentioned that uh, a lot of these things, a lot of them are, are like, for example, the medications and the walking, like it's not one or the other. Most of the time it is, it is a combination. There's that balance um, and walking is, is very important. Um, but yeah, if we move on to the next slide. Uh, so statins are another uh, medication that could be prescribed. Uh, so in the study, they had uh, roughly 155,000 veterans uh, and they broke it down um, to those that weren't on any statin medication, those that were on low to moderate intensity statins, and those were on high intensity statins. And they did a, a Kaplan-Meier analysis, and those are kind of the graphs on the right side. Um, so the solid black line are those that have no statins, and then the, uh, the other two lines would be the low, moderate, and high intensity statins. Um, and on the, the y-axis, so the left axis, um, you have the death rate, or the mortality rate, and the uh, rate of amputation. Um, so in this study, they found that, uh, using any statin medication at the time of, uh, peripheral artery di disease di diagnosis will, uh, have better overall survival and amputation free survival compared to the active comparator, which would just be no statins. Um, and they kind of did a, a bit of a analysis. So if you go to the next slide, they did a, uh, they looked at a series of confounders. So they looked at age presence of, uh, CAD or year of diagnosis, and they adjusted for them using a, a statistical method that we don't have to really touch on too much, but they essentially found that the, this pattern still stayed. Um, so if you look at the numbers on the left side of the screen, the hazard ratios were used. And when you have a number under one, it suggests that there would be a smaller risk of um, PAD, or sorry, a smaller risk of amputation or, and a higher risk of survival. Um, so the pattern still stuck around and the high intensity statins had a more significant benefit uh, for both outcomes with a 30% risk reduction in mortality and a 39% risk reduction in amputation. And obviously the low to moderate also had very similar results. So again, a medication isn't always the answer, but it does have uh, benefits. And lastly, we're just gonna touch on a few different surgical options. Um, so we're gonna start with angioplasty. And the primary goal of angioplasty as a treatment um, is to restore blood flow in a clogged artery and increase the delivery of oxygen-rich blood to the body's muscles and tissues. Uh, so angioplasty is most effective in widening larger arteries, uh, arteries with short blocked areas or arteries that are narrowed and not blocked. So if we look at the uh, image on the left, this kind of just shows a little bit how it works. Um, so you obviously see kind of that blockage there. You put in the stent with the balloon, um, the balloon's inflated to expand the stent and then removed from the expand and then it gets removed. So that's just uh, a quick overview of angioplasty. Next, we'll be talking about arthrectomy. Um, so in this procedure, it utilizes a catheter with a sharp blade on the end to remove plaque from a blood vessel. Uh, the catheter is inserted into the artery through a small puncture in the artery and is performed under local anesthesia. Uh, the catheter is designed to collect and remove plaque in a chamber in the tip, which allows removal of the plaque as this device is removed from the artery. 
Uh, the process can be repeated at the time the treatment is performed to remove a significant amount of disease from the artery, uh, thus eliminating a blockage from arthrosclerotic disease. And the last one we'll be touching on is bypass surgery. And this one's a little bit uh, more significant. So for patients who are not good candidates for angioplasty who have already failed a prior angioplasty attempt, lower extremity bypass surgery is a well-established and highly effective procedure. Uh, during these procedures, surgeons create an alternative path for blood flow to get around the area of blockage and restore direct flow to the lower leg and foot. Uh, this is a major surgical procedure, as I mentioned, uh, which is performed under anesthesia, the incision to the leg. So careful assessments of the risks and benefits prior to surgery, as well as diligent medical anesthetic and surgical care ensures the best outcomes following leg bypass operations. So again, it, a doctor would obviously have to look at kind of if you looked at angioplasty, what medications you're on before um, jumping to a bypass surgery. Okay, so we mentioned combination therapy, but there were two studies that we wanted to highlight. So when you're looking to treat a disease through medication, rarely is there a single cure-all drug that solves all the symptoms you're experiencing. In most cases, it's usually a specific combination of drugs with specific dosages that you have to take to subside your particular set of symptoms. Um, so the two studies you'll be looking at is the COMPASS and the Voyager trials. So these studies look at the efficacy of the combination therapy of 2.5 milligrams of rivaroxaban, or you might know it by the more common name Xarelto, twice a day, plus low-dose aspirin, so 100 milligrams, or just aspirin by itself. Um, so the COMPASS trial uh, looked at um, just in um, cor uh, coronary artery disease patients, um, without any surgical interventions. So overall, the study uh, showed that the combination therapy group had an absolute risk reduction in cardiovascular death, stroke, and myocardial infarction. So the cumulative hazard ratio, so chances of these events occurring with combination therapy, divided by the chances of these events occurring with just aspirin at 30 months was determined to be 80%. So all in all, the 2.5 milligrams of rivoxaban um, twice a day reduced the risk of heart attacks, stroke and cardiovascular death by 24%. So uh, these images just show the different percentage of ha the hazard ratios um, according to the, each uh, the group that they measured. So there's age, there's the vascular bed affected by arthrosclerosis, EGFR, previous medical history. Um, and you can see that for all categories, the combination therapy group represented by the blue line um, is lower risk than the aspirin group represented by the red one. So while bleeding was a large concern for the combination therapy group, as mentioned, uh, taking both anticoagulants, so the Xarelto and the antiplatelet, the aspirin, um, them being both blood thinners, greatly increasing your risk of bleeding, the study showed that bleeding events only accounted for a small percentage of the total number of events, and there weren't any significant differences between the two groups. So they determined that the benefit of the large reduction in the number of ischemic events, so the events that occur as a result of restrictive blood flow, flow outweighed the increased severe bleeding events. So interestingly, they also found that the higher that there was higher risk reduction using combination therapy for those in higher risk subgroups. So they measured four high risk factors. So uh, the number of vascular beds you that were affected by arthrosclerosis, renal dysfunction, um, heart failure and diabetes, and found that while the four uh, high-risk feature groups, so the group that uh, had all four uh, high-risk factors, only had nine patients over the 30 months that needed to be treated, the no high-risk feature group had 113. Um, yeah, so seeing, showing how um, it really benefited the high-risk groups. So the Voyager trials um, was basically looking at the same thing, except for people who, uh, had undergone the lower extremity revascularization surgery. Um, so it is known that people who undergo peripheral revascularization have approximately four times higher risk of subsequent vascular complications than someone who has never gone uh, undergone the surgery at all. So what's special about this study is while there have been other studies looking at combination therapy um, after revascularization, um, for cardiovascular and stroke outcomes, uh, there was never one that specifically looked like limb outcomes. So this is what this study did. Um, so uh, to see if combination therapy can help their outcomes, they measured uh, four different factors. So acute limb, uh, acute limb ischemia, major amputation because of vascular reasons, heart attack, stroke, and cardiovascular 
related deaths, um, they found that the results were pretty much consistent with the COMPASS study. So uh, for the combination group, the number of estimated incidences at three years was 17.3%, while for the aspirin group, it was 19.9%. So again, no significant differences were found in the bleeding outcomes for the two groups with 62 patients and 44 patients experiencing symptoms in the combination of the aspirin group respectively. So I just kind of spewed out a lot of um, statistics there, but um, I guess the main conclusion was that, um, that they estimated that for every 10,000 patients who were treated for one year, Xarelto at a dose of 2.5 milligrams twice a day added to aspirin could prevent 181 uh, primary, primary efficacy outcome events. So the four that they measured, acute limb ischemia, major amputation, heart attack, stroke, and cardiac uh, vascular related deaths at the cost of 29 uh, safety outcomes, so fatal bleeding events and other major bleeding events. So um, there's definitely a benefit to the combination therapy, and as mentioned, it's definitely something that uh, you need to discuss with your physician about, but uh, the benefits are uh, quite, um, uh, quite present, and uh, they're uh, yeah, they're very good for uh, treating uh, peripheral artery disease and something that um, might be, uh, you might want to take into consideration. Yeah, so thank you for listening to our presentation and we hopefully we answered some of the questions that you have regarding peripheral artery disease. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions, you can enter them in the chat and if not, uh, uh, have a great night. Wonderful. Um... Are there any questions or anything people want to bring up, Bob? I just want to thank the entire team. Jerry, are there anybody out there? Or Jenner, Jerry, you have give some final thoughts there. Usually we give that to Stuart, but you're, you're taking over, Chase. What's your thoughts, Jerry? Yeah, I, I think this is a really informative, um, informative webinar, and we, I think the patients learned a lot about what works for peripheral artery disease. So I think the main points that you guys, these guys brought up, right, exercise and also medications are very important. So definitely, please consider those two options. Talk to your, uh, your doctor about those. And yeah, I, I enjoyed all the information. I think the patients would uh, find it very be beneficial. Yeah, so, so to me, some of the take home messages is that uh, if you get pains in your extremities, especially your calf, your thigh, your buttock area that's coming on when exertion, you stop, goes away 30 seconds to a couple of minutes later, you get up and walk again. Uh, it's probably very consistent with claudication. Uh, again, it's different than arthritis, which is pain that you wake up in the morning with, that you're there all the time, uh, it's an achiness. It, uh, it's certainly worse when you bend and move around because that's what arthritis does, but it's not predominantly exertional related. Yes, you will have more aches and pains in your joints when you overuse your joints, but we're looking at for something in the muscle area. That's, that's claudication. Um, the best therapy actually for, for arthritis and for claudication turns out to be exercise. Uh, you'll have to work through that. You will get some discomfort in your leg, but if you go on a six month program and hopefully a lifelong program, uh, the results are comparable to, to surgery for, for many of us. Now, if you have critical limb ischemia, you're having rest discomfort, you have ulcers on your legs, um, that's the time to consider urgent surgery because you don't want to lose that lower extremity. Uh, we now know that uh, one of the important things is I don't know how to stop getting older, but I can age healthier. I can know my blood pressure and my plea to everybody is to measure your blood pressure two weeks before your upcoming appointment, measure it three times, twice a day. Uh, the first day or two, the blood pressure will be falsely high and the first blood pressure reading will be falsely high because you're a little bit anxious, but do a relaxed environment um, your bladder empty, no tear coffee for a half an hour, and the resting blood pressure and average is important to know that and to document that. I know smoking is, is a hard thing to give up. If you can't stop, slow down and ask for help. Um, we think about um, blood pressure and we think about um, cholesterol medications um, independently, but to be honest with you, is that I don't think of, I, 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 I'm going to get a get rid of the word of a cholesterol medication. Uh, this, these are medications to, to make your arteries last longer and to decrease blockage in your arteries. They happen to lower cholesterol, LDL cholesterol. Same thing with blood pressure pills. 
Um, I'm not treating my blood pressure just to treat a blood pressure. I'm doing to protect against stroke, peripheral vascular disease, kidney disease. Um, one thing that you should look, look on your blood work is called your GFR, uh, your kidney function. So basically, if your GFR is less than 60, that means you're probably developing blockages uh, in different parts of your body. And you can use the kidneys to, to look at that. It's much more common in diabetes. So know, know your numbers. Uh, please take a look at 30 Days to Healthier You. Uh, Jerry, uh, Hannah, and Dia have put a remarkable group together. Uh, again, it took me 60 years to get, get healthier thanks to them and realize that my mind plays tricks. I have these thoughts that come through my mind. I react to uh, many situations, and uh, now I, I don't have to react as strongly, uh, and I can be healthier and so can you. So uh, the team put together a wonderful presentation. Do you have peripheral vascular disease? Do you have blocked arteries in your legs? Well, let's find out. And one way is an ankle breakout. Index, another way is just getting discomfort in your legs. Look at your legs. Uh, if you have diabetes, make sure you have good foot care because you don't want to lose your feet. You want to keep your feet as healthy as you possibly can. Uh, thank you so much, everybody. Uh, for, for a wonderful presentation. This is one that, uh, like most of the presentation, you have to look at two or three times, fast forward certain parts. Um, and if you want your ankle break or index measured, let us know. And when we get the equipment in, we'll be sure to contact you. And if you want help, um, getting healthier, go ahead and do it. Let's everybody do a six minute walk test. Let's see how, how, how we're doing right now. And uh, I have to figure out how many steps I did today. Um, is that, uh, so it's kind of interesting how our vacations are. At one time it was all exclusive in Mexico. Now it's basically walking active across Canada. We went fishing today. We saw some whales. Uh, we saw a bear. Uh, we're, uh, we went whitewater rafting yesterday. We're going to go kayaking tomorrow. We're going to try surfing again. Um, and just being active. And uh, so far, I'm averaging 25,000 steps a day on my vacation. I'm trying to get to six hours of sleep. So um, I'm trying to be healthier. And we, uh, instead of going to restaurants, we um, uh, have our own food and we rent a place. And uh, today we have our own fish to catch. So uh, we have to cut dinner. So um, I hope this is something that uh, resonates with everybody. Uh, find ways to be healthier, you'll live longer and feel better. Thank you so much.